So it has a uh, like different layers that are protecting our uh, brain. So first we'll start with the skull and the skull protects the brain as you, as I told earlier and the spine and your or the vertebral column whatever you, whatever you want to call it it protects our spinal cord. So and there is a a jelly mucusy like fluid between these areas uh, which provide nutrients and protection which is called a cerebrospinal fluid if you can see in the slide so that is one thing and in the cns it is like it has a three layer protective uh, membrane called the meninges so that is in the brain and also in your like spinal cord and this uh, let me talk more about the cerebrospinal uh, fluid, which is in short called the CSF. So it's a clear colorless fluid that surrounds our, it's in between our brain and the skull. And it like helps us, helps the brain from getting physical, uh, like protection again from physical trauma and all that stuff. And it helps carry nutrients and waste, waste products and all that stuff. So uh, like an example for your uh, like central nervous system, I could say it, it sends. So I'll give an example based on what you do every day, which is eat your meal. So when you see your meal, your central nervous system sends a, a signal, an electrical impulse to your stomach and your uh, like mouth salivary glands to start producing saliva and also send signals to your stomach, which start producing your gastric juices, which help in digestion. So that's what uh, the one of the example of the central nervous system. Then we have our brain, which is the most complex organ. So I think I'm going to talk a lot about the brain here. So the brain is uh, the most complex organ in the human body and like it is responsible for a lot of things like thought behavior emotion uh, like i said sensation motor control and all that stuff so the brain is actually divided into two main parts which is the cerebrum which is a uh, as you can see in the diagram which all uh, the blue, purple, green, orange part. It's just the cerebr cerebrum and the pink chewing gum like bubble gum like looking stuff in the bottom, that's your cerebellum. So I'm going to emphasize a lot on the cerebrum here. So the cerebrum is like the largest part of the brain and it is responsible for like high uh cognitive functions like thinking learning uh also remembering and forgetting and language memory and all that stuff and the cerebrum is also responsible for controlling your voluntary movements like your uh which the moves you do based on like how you want to do it. you have control over it then we are moving on to the cerebral cortex, which is the thin outermost layer of the cerebrum. And it's it's like, uh, it's having these uh, wrinkled appearance, like due to its ridges and grooves or fissures or folds, whatever you want to call it. it. That's why our brain looks like a thick, like jelly substance, because it's mostly made of fat and protein, but that uh, the fissures and folds is what give it that uh, text, like that pattern. So the cerebral cortex is again divided into two parts. Your, so your brain is like, uh, like a symmetrical organ. So if you cut right between it, you, you will have two equal and two symmetrical parts. So there is uh, again the left and right hemisphere and which is or like connected by nerve fibers, then how the uh, cerebrum actually works is 
like when you uh, see a picture or of a puppy or a a brick wall you will uh, like process that information and your brain will like start thinking of it so now when i said brick wall or puppies you imagined uh, a certain picture of a a dog a certain breed of a dog and when i said brick wall you might have imagined a red brick wall with a like a gray cement in between it at, at least that's what i imagined so uh, it helps us like to get all these uh, make all these images and all that stuff it's the main function of the cerebrum and the cerebrum is now divided into four lobes as you can see in the slide uh, the blue one is called the frontal lobe and it, the frontal lobe is responsible for your decision making problem solving uh, producing your own type of personality and uh, what i said earlier your voluntary movements and a bit of speech not completely involved in speech but and in speech then next you have your parietal lobe which is responsible for like awareness attention language and the all the sensory areas and it's in like involved in processing like taste touch temperature and all that stuff and it also plays a, a major role in your language processing like reading and all so that's about the parietal lobe the next is the green lobe you see behind uh, it's as we go back it, now this is the occipital lobe and it is responsible for your uh, visual information so it's what help you see so if you even if you like if you don't have that part of the brain then i you would be blind and you would you won't be you'll be having vision problems so it's connected the that part of the brain is actually connected to your uh, eyes with nerves so it's crucial for vision then the next one the orange one here is the temporal lobe where we uh, it processes hearing and a part of memory and language and it uh, it's mostly uh, responsible for your auditory information and it's processing your auditory information so it's um, how can i say it helps you hear basically and it also works with uh, uh, your hippo hippocampus, which is include like like uh, essential for your memory. So it's very your temporal lobe is where your learning and memory occurs. So I'll go more detail into uh, the temporal lobe in learning and memory. But now uh, we can move to the cerebellum. So. Then we have another part called a brainstem and cerebellum. So this pink chewing gum like looking thing is your cerebellum and it's uh, behind, located like behind your brain and under the occipital lobe. And it's made up of, it also has two hemisphere uh, like flappy like structure. It's like a, it's not a complete like hemisphere, but it's like two flaps. And it receives like in sensory information from your muscles and your vestibular system, which is responsible for your like body balance. And uh, yeah, and it helps you to walk and run and all that stuff. So how this cerebellum works is when you ride a bike or walk, it helps you like maintain your balance to your vestibular system, connect, which is connected to uh, your brain through nerves. And it helps you uh, remember how to balance yourself, uh, whether it's riding a bike or just walking as it is. And it's also responsible for motor control and coordination, which is 
related to balance and timing. And it's uh, it's also involved in uh, cognitive functions such as language and learning. Because uh, even if certain parts of the brain have certain uh, like functions, they all are interrelated somehow. So they all help in uh, like one function, like they're interconnected. So the next we are going to the brainstem and the brainstem is the part of the brain that connects this uh, the thick jelly like mass cerebrum to our spinal cord. So, and it's responsible for, actually the brainstem also has its function. So it's responsible for breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, sleep, wake cycles and all that stuff. So, and it also plays a role in, a role in consciousness. We'll get to that in the slide of consciousness. So basically breathing, heart rate, blood, blood pressure and all that is it's your uh, involuntary actions where you cannot control it uh, completely. So your brainstem is again divided into three parts. Yeah, we're going a bit deep into this. So your brainstem has a med the medulla, uh, the pons, and the midbrain. So the midbrain is at the topmost. It's the highest part of the brainstem. And like it's responsible for reflexes. Like when you when somebody's coming to punch at you, you have to block it somehow. So if you don't have the midbrain, you won't be able to block. You'll be just standing there getting the punch. So it helps you uh, like with your reflexes and it helps you process the visual and auditory information as well. Uh, it's also interrelated with uh, what I said earlier. Now, and it contributes to the control of eye movement. So even if it doesn't, like it's not uh, giving us vision, the midbrain, it's not giving it any vision, but it helps in eye movement. So even if your, if your midbrain wasn't there, you would see, but your eyeballs wouldn't move. And yeah, that's about vision. Then it helps us in hearing uh, and relay the auditory information to our auditory cortex, which is a different part of the brain, uh, which is help us in hearing. And it helps us in movement. So people who don't have uh, have defect in the midbrain of some specialized cells, they will have the uh, Parkinson's disease and all that stuff. Uh, then midbrain also contains uh, an area which is involved in our reward system. Like it releases dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter. We will get into neurotransmitters as well. So it releases do dopamine, which is, gives us pleasure and reward. That's about the midbrain. Next is the pons. So the pons is between, as you can see, between the midbrain and the medulla. So the pons is helps in sleep wake cycle. So it's involved in your sleep, basically. And it helps in breathing. Uh, and it also helps in uh, movement. So it is also connected, like uh, interrelated to your cerebellum, which helps in uh, balance and coordination. And it uh, uh, main uh, another function is it controls our facial muscles also. So we can like, even if we have emotion, we can show it. Because if uh, there was a defect in the pond, even if we feel it, we can't show it. We would be like, we won't uh, show our emotions, even though we feel it. Next is our medulla, uh, which is the lowest part of the brainstem and it is connected to our spinal cord and the rest of the spinal system. So it's like a junction uh, between the brain and the brainstem is like the junction between the brain and the spinal cord. And it's the lowest, part of the brainstem, as I said, it's most important uh, for control of involuntary functions like 
digestion and certain reflexes like when you're sneezing or coughing and it's directly joined with the spinal cord as i said it's, it's like a junction between the brain and the spinal cord and it helps us in uh, heart rate breathing first uh, which is an involuntary action heart rate and blood blood, blood pressure uh, which is because it's connected to our cardiovascular center and it also helps us in swallowing. So uh, that's where digestion comes in. It uh, helps us in controlling our swallowing. So it, that's also very crucial. And reflexes such as cough and sneeze reflex, as I said earlier. So how the uh, brainstem works, uh, if I need to give an example, uh, when your heart beats, like, uh, your brain sends a message uh, to your mus to the muscles in your heart to tell it to contract and expand. So if your brain didn't do that, your heart our heart won't be pumping blood right now. So yeah, it's all thanks to the brain. Then we have we are moving on to the thalamus and hypothalamus, which is situated in the brain, in the center of the brain. So the thalamus is like a relay station. So if you're getting signals for your hearing, it will send to the auditory cortex. And if you're getting signals to see, uh, like see uh, as in vision, then it will go to your occipital lobe. So that's what the thalamus does. It acts as a relay station to direct information to appropriate areas of the brain and it is also involved in emotions and consciousness so uh, the thalamus is actually located in the brain center and it is also made up of two hemispheres one on each side of each side of the brain uh, so as i said uh, the example for thalamus is it sends our visual information to the occipital lobe which is Help, which what, uh, which is what helps us see, and it also helps a uh, helps us hear by transferring our auditory information to the temporal lobe, which is what helps us hear. Now the next thing is our hypothalamus. So it is a it's a very small region located below the thalamus, and it has a lot of functions like sleep, hunger, thirst, uh, body temperature, it controls all, the, all of that. And it also plays a, a big role in emotion and motivation and regulating our body temperature. So it uh, sends signal to our sweat glands, like where sweat is produced and muscles to generate heat or lose heat, like generate heat when we feel too cold or lose heat, uh, as in sweat to feel more cooler. Then in controlling hunger and thirst, it will send uh, signals to our brain when the body is nutrient deficient, like when we are hungry or thirsty. Then regulating sleep-wake cycles. So the hypothalamus also helps in our sleep cycle where there's a gland in our hypothalamus which produces uh, this hormone called melatonin, which is uh, helpful and that regulates our sleep. So that's how our sleep cycle works and controlling the release of hormones. So the hypothalamus uh, is uh, also controlling a part of the endocrine system, which is the pituitary gland, uh, which is I'm not going too deep into that because I would need another extra 10 minutes to like explain that. But it uh, releases various hormones, which uh, helps in growth and metabolism and reproduction and all that stuff. So that's about the hypothalamus. Mostly the hypothalamus is like, it'll help us in, oh, mostly involved with hormones. So that's about the hypothalamus. Then we have our peripheral nervous system, which is the nerves. And uh, 
as you can see, no, the bunch of fibers called nerves here and ganglia, we'll get into that. So our peripheral nervous system is the system that lies outside the brain and spinal cord and it's like distributed all over to our body. So we can send signals from different part, body parts to the brain. And it is made up of uh, nerves and ganglia and neuromascular junctions. So we'll get into that. So nerves are like bundles of nerve fibers which carry the signals or electrical impulses to the to the brain. And there are two types of uh, like uh, nerves. There is sensory nerves and motor nerves. So what sensory nerves does is it carries signals to the brain from all of our body parts to the brain. And motor nerves carry all the signals from the brain to the body parts. And the ganglia are like located in between of the sensory and motor nerve to like, it's interrelated with that. And it helps, it's mainly in the spinal cord and thalamus and the brain area to just uh, pass on the information act as a, like a post office. So, that's what ganglia is and neuromascular junctions. So these neuromascular muscular junctions is the site where your nerves connect to your muscles or any organ uh, where it, wherein it will reach, the signal will reach. So if your signal is meant for the muscles, it is through the junctions that they receive the signal. And as you can see in the flow chart, uh, I've like put in the slide, it, uh, the nervous system is divided into two parts, which is our central and peripheral, but the peripheral is again divided into autonomic and somatic. So we'll talk about the somatic system first. It, uh, so somatic is responsible for our voluntary movement, uh, which means we can consciously control the movements of the muscles in our somatic system. So it, it we have full control over it. And autonomic nervous system is responsible for the involuntary functions, such as breathing, heart rate, and blood pressure. So what I told uh, in the central nervous system. Then our autonomous nervous system is again divided into sympathetic and parasympathetic. So this works in like time at a time of what do you say, like uh, where we need a lot of energy. So I'm not also going too detailed in that as well because it's a very big topic. And what we can say, I'll just give you an example so you understand. So when you're nervous, like when you're running, like say you have a dog, you saw a dog, you're scared of it, you're running. And when you're running, your autonomic nervous system like increases your heart rate and increases your blood pressure and increases your intake of oxygen, uh, which is respiration and provide uh, which provide like nutrients to the muscles. So you get that energy so you can run away from that dog. And when you're sleeping, your the parasympathetic nervous system it decreases your like heart rate, blood pressure, and all that stuff, so your body can rest and repair from the the all that running you just did. So that's how our pulse, uh, the peripheral nervous system works. The next we have neurons. Neurons are like the cells that make up uh, our nervous system. So in every nerve, there are billions and billions, especially in our brain, there are billions and billions of neurons. Uh, there's a specific count, but I don't know. Uh, but there are uh, billions of neurons that make up our nervous system. And this is responsible for all that electric signal passing. So your neurons are like made up of three main parts. Uh, you can see a lot of parts here. Is the branchy looking thing, we call it the dendrite, and this purple circle with a face on it, we call it the nucleus. And the area around that uh, face, we call it the cell body. 
And the long structure, we call it the axon. And this long structure of axon, sometimes, not all of them, but some of them might have this purple. It's not always purple, but it's uh, purple here to represent it. So it's always like wrapped up in this thing called the myelin sheet. So it can send the electrical sickness faster. It can like accelerate, increase the speed of the electrical signals. And this is the axon terminals, uh, where the axon is divided into different branches. And this is a synapse. So we'll talk about the uh, terminals and synapse later. So the structure of the neuron, it has, we'll focus on the cell body, which contains the nucleus and other organelles, like which is uh, essential for a cell. Then we have dendrites. Those are like the branchy substance that receive signals from neurons or like start receiving signals. And the axon is the long extension that transmits signals to other, other neurons. Then that's a, this is a typical uh, structure of the neuron, but there are different types. We, so we'll go into that later. But another type of cell in our nervous system is the glial cells. People don't talk about the glial cells much. Mostly they talk about the neuron, but the glial cells, also known as neuroglia, it's, uh, it's uh, there in our CNS and PNS as well. So it provides like protection to your uh, like regular basic neurons. So as you can see, I'll show you in the next slide uh, the different types. So the second blue one, which we saw, that is a basic typical neuron, which uh, and it's a motor neuron, which means it uh, like gets information from the brain to all part of the body. And this is a bipolar neuron. Uh, and these two are, which are on the right, which look like a coral. That's what I feel like, but yeah, which looks like the coral. This one is our glial cells, which provide support and uh, help the other neurons that you see here. So these are the types. Then we have neural communication, how the electrical uh, signals transfer from one neuron to another neuron. So as you can see here in this picture, you can see this uh, green part, which is the end of a neuron, uh, which is end of the neuron and comes after the axon terminals. This is called a synapse. So this, uh, this is called the synapse and this is another dendrite of another neuron. So it's all connected like, uh, like, in a, like a web. So how this works is, uh, the synapse is like a junction and the electric sig signals is transferred from the synapse to the dendrite of a new neuron. And how this is done is they release this thing. You can see, I think it's a pink ball, the pink ball thingy. Those are neurotransmitters, which like there are different types of neurotransmitters, but these are uh, what help like transmit electrical signals. So, so I'll tell more about neurotransmitters here. So these are like chemicals that are released at the synapses between the, at that junction and the neurotransmitter bind to your uh, receptors, which are present. So the orange, like, uh, what do you say? These hair-like substance, this dotty orange-like substance. So that is your receptor, which is uh, found on your dendrite and your neurotransmitter like kind of binds with it, like fixes itself like a puzzle. So it, uh, which like facilitates the signal, the electrical signal. So I'll, I'm going to talk about different uh, neurotransmitters. So first we'll go with the basic one, which is dopamine, as I explained earlier. It helps to regulate your reward behavior and mood and control of some body movements. So it's where, if dopamine is released, you'll feel a like you'll have a good feeling and you'll have a it right like help 
regulate your behavior and it will feel a sensation of pleasure. So that's about the dopamine. Then we have serotonin, which is also similar to dopamine, but it helps like with your sleep, appetite, and mood and all that stuff. It's a bit similar to serotonin. So if you're eating healthy, you're exercising very well, your uh, serotonin level will be high and you'll be feeling great. But if you're like your sleep cycle schedule is messed up and um let's say you're not exercising as much then your serotonin is will be low and you won't be having that good feeling then then we have norepinephrine or what everybody calls adrenaline which is the key like function to the sympathetic nervous system as i said earlier so which helps in the fight or flight response so fight as in like uh when a danger comes up you have to like your body will start preparing to uh, like your body will start armoring your uh, like arming yourself to prepare for that uh like situation you're in so that's where uh, adrenaline comes in uh, that's where uh, adrenaline adrenaline is secreted then we have acetylcholine which is important for your muscle control and uh, <coughs> just a minute. It, which is important for your muscle control and hormone secretion as well as cognitive function. So these are uh, some uh, like neurotransmitter, but there are others like glutamate and GABA and all this stuff, uh, which I'm not going to like too into it, uh, but that's it. That's the neural communication, how electric signal is transferred in our nervous system. Then we have, we're going into our uh, learning and memory. So before learning and we go into how memories form, how we learn, we need to know what is learning and what is memory. So learning can be a process where we acquire knowledge and Memory can be a process where we store the knowledge and take it out whenever we need it. So how memories form, it uh, like uh, how memories form are like when we experience something, when we see something, or when someone tells us their name, something we should be remembering but we always forget. So when somebody tells us their name, our that name will be like whatever we hear or it will be converted into an electric Im electrical impulse and it will be converted into uh, like a signal and it travels through the neurons and it will be encoded in our like brain. So there are like two types of encoding, which is sensory encoding and, uh, and semantic encoding, okay? So the sensory encoding is like converting the information into a form that can be stored in a brain. So for example, uh, like when we see an object, our visual uh, like cortex or in the occipital lobe, it will encode that information. Like, like if you see, a, let's say a board, a, which has all the colors of the rainbow. And it will help your visual, uh, like occipital lobe and your visual cortex will help you like remember how that ball looks like. And semantic encoding is like assigning meaning to that sensory information. So when we see that ball, we need to know that it's a ball. So that's how, for example, when we see a dog, we need to know that it's a dog. So that's semantic encoding, which is, uh, giving meaning to the thing we just saw or heard. Then we have, uh, then we're going to talk about the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is like a horse-shaped structure uh, which is involved in encoding the memories and it is where uh, 
most of the memory and all is shared. All the things we learn is most of uh, the things we learn are stored, uh, memories are stored in the hippocampus. So, like when you learn a new name, your hippocampus will help you store the name in your memory. So, to tell more about the hippocampus, I'm going to tell a story. So, uh, this story is about a person uh, called Henry Molaison. So, I'm not going to say Henry Molaison for the rest of the story. I'm just going to say H.M. He's uh, popularly known as H.M. So, uh, in the story, what happens, is it, and it's a real story, okay? it's not uh, fictional, so it's a real life thing. Uh, so, in about 1952, the neuro, uh, there was a very renowned neurosurgeon called William Scoville. We just call him Will. Uh, and he performed a risky operation on HM. So, what the problem with uh, HM was, he, he hurt his head and he started having seizures. So, Will removed his hippocampus actually, uh, which actually uh, stopped the seizures and helped HM, but it also resulted in him having memory impairment and having memory loss. So the dude, even if he doesn't have seizures anymore, he doesn't remember anything that happened in his life. So his, everybody was like, that's when they understood that the hippocampus was the area that gives us memory and which stores memory and all that stuff. So removing that, it uh, just wiped out the guy's memory. So a neuroscientist, like a PhD student, we'll call her Brenda, uh, she was sent to his home to conduct studies on him and like work on him and like like he was basically a lab rat, lab rat in his own house so uh, he she conducted studies on him to like gain knowledge from him so most of the thing he forgot uh, but he whatever he did with his cerebellum he didn't forget. Like if he had learned to ride a bike, he didn't forget all that because that memory is stored in the cerebellum. It's not in the hippocampus. So they were supposed like they uh, got a lot of information for from him and his brain was even after his death, his brain was still studied by a neuroscientist and he was like uh like considered a, and he was like remembered by the neuroscientists and people who are studying neuroscience now, he was remembered by them. And that's how uh, this HM like uh, got famous. And he continues to like help uh, neuroscientists to this day with like using himself as an experiment. So that is solidify, solidifying his legacy. So that is the story of HM. If you want more, I think there's a video about him. You could go watch that. Uh, but the thing is, uh, from that, we learned uh, that uh, we got to uh, know the term long-term potentiation, or uh, which is called LTP, or long-term memory. So. When we learn something new, our synaptic connections are formed and uh, like the existing connections are strengthened. So when we uh, like uh, learn something new, it either goes into the place of short-term memory or either goes into a place of long-term memory. So that helps like uh, if it, uh, if it's in the short term memory area, then it will you lose that memory in uh, a few minutes, like seven to ten minutes. But you can recall it. Uh, so if you like recall and uh, try to remember it, it 
then uh, gradually will be stored in your long term uh, memory area. So uh, there's this thing called retrieval, and there are two types of retrieval where we recall something or recognize something. So recall recalling is the ability to retrieve information which you have learned without go, like thinking about it for too long. And recognition, as you know, is uh, to identify something presented to you. So for example, recognizing your friends when you see them or recognizing a word you're, when you're reading it. So that's what with uh, uh, recall and recognition and that's how learning and memory works. Then we have uh, neurological disorders. So uh, there are a lot of lots of neurological disorder which uh, is caused due to a wide range of symptoms. So first one is movement symptoms, which causes seizures. As I said in the story, uh, the dude hurt his head. He got seizures. So he had movement disorder, and uh, then there is sensory disorder where some part of your senses is hurt, like some part of your brain is hurt where your senses are active. So you have difficulty in seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling and all that stuff. And then we have cognitive disorders, which is difficulty in thinking, remembering and making decisions and all that stuff. So. I, I think Alzheimer's is a cognitive disorder, you could say that. And there's a behavioral disorders where you will have changes in uh, mood, personality, or behavior. So that anxiety and depression comes under that. And communication disorder. So you'll have difficulty speaking or understanding language. So those are the types of disorders. Next is the causes. The causes can be a lot. There are there can be a lot of causes. It can be genetic, can be uh, like caused by mutation, and it can be caused by infection. It can be caused by injury, as I told in the story. Uh, and it can be an autoimmune disorder, which means your body's immune system starts attacking your nervous system. So uh, that's when your immune system thinks that your nerve, some of your nerve cells are like pathogens, as in bacteria or viruses. Then we have environmental factors such as exposure to toxins, which is drugs and alcohol. Uh, so that could uh, like lead to some neurological disorders. So those are the types and causes of neurological disorders. Then we have, uh, we have some examples like Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's is a disease caused by like buildup of plague in your brain, which kills your nerve cells. And you'll have a lot of memory loss, confusion, and difficulty speaking and all in Alzheimer's. Then ALS. Uh, ALS is uh, like caused by your degeneration of the motor neurons in the brain and spinal cord. And it has like its symptoms are muscle weakness, uh, like in the hands or uh, in your limbs. So that's ALS. Then autism spectrum disorder, which is uh, still unknown. The causes of it are still unknown, but it's a developmental disorder. It affects your communication and behavior. Then we have epilepsy. So it's a condition where there is a lot of bursts of electrical activity in the brain. So this causes seizures. So like stroke, brain tumor, and brain infection will have all that when you are having epilepsy. And it can be also caused by drug misuse or alcohol misuse and lack of oxygen during birth. So if you didn't get enough oxygen during birth, you, would you might be prone to epilepsy. Then we have Parkinson's, uh, which is also a common disease caused by the loss of nerve cells, which controls like movement and coordination. So we'll ha you'll have muscle seizures and your it will affect your facial muscles. So it will affect your expressions and it will have a slow movement in which may like 
you'll have a slow movement in when you're walking and all. So that's with Parkinson's. And next, I think we have consciousness. So I'm not going to detail about, uh, going to go to detail about consciousness. So consciousness is like an awareness of one's existence. You know you are here because you're conscious. So it's a, it's a topic that is still uh, being discovered by neuroscientists and all. Uh, so it's a complex, like a uh, complex topic and it needs to be fully understood. So, and there are many theories about consciousness. Like when we, uh, it's consciousness that help us uh, think about like a mathematical problem where we like put information together to solve a problem. So uh, our mind can like manipulate the information uh, due to consciousness and help to solve the problem. So that is a few thing about consciousness. And since it's, a, since it's still an early topic, uh, it, like it has a lot of uh, challenges like developing and understanding the relationship between consciousness and cognitive functions, understanding the role of consciousness and decision making, and understanding what happens with the neurons, uh, what is the neural basis of consciousness. So before I move on to the next slide, um, there's a small brain gym type game. Uh, so if anybody's volunteering to play the game, you can raise your hand. So anybody wants to Okay, uh, I think Devashesh raised his hands first. So Devashesh, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the game is you, I'll be showing you words, but you don't, you should not read the words, you should read the colors of it. Do you understand? Oh. So if yeah. the word is written, written black, but it shows in a red font, then you have to say red. Okay. Got it? Yeah. Okay. So I'm. I'll be moving on to the next slide, and you can start. Uh. Okay. Red, yellow, green. Uh. Light blue. Uh. Black. Yeah. Orange. Uh. I don't know that color is off white. Yeah. Gray. Pink. Purple. Brown. Dark. Good. Anybody else wants to go? Yes. I want okay. to go. You are not Who is it? Yeah, I would like to go. You are can you tell your name? Hi, Ayan. Yeah, you can go. As fast as possible, okay? Okay. Red, yellow, green, blue, black, orange, off white, white, pink, purple, brown, uh, blue. Yeah, Dark that's blue. true. So... Um, I'm sorry to everybody who's raising your hand. We don't have much time. So I'm just going to with two people today. Uh, so I'll just move on. So before I uh, talk about cognitive neuroscience, what happened in this game was your brain was, uh, it, it involves like psychology and a bit of cognitive neuroscience. So what happened is your brain started focusing on the area where attention and perception is needed. So your uh, frontal cortex, your parietal cortex, and your basal ganglia started working together. That's what made you like, uh, uh, like give attention and perception in the game. Now, in cognitive neuroscience, uh, first we need to know uh, what is cognitive neuroscience. So it's a another field of scientific study that combines uh, like psychology and neuroscience to like investigate in decision making and problem solving and creativity and cognition is like uh like in it's a central focus of discussion so it involves like uh, processes like uh, remembering knowing uh, understanding communicating and learning so for example, like when we think of the concept fruit, we think of something like something that's sweet, something that's um, that has seeds or something that is grown in plants. So 
we are categorizing it with our cognition. And with that, we have concepts and prototypes. So concepts are like mental groupings. So how, like I said, categorizing things and prototypes are giving images uh, to the, like, uh, to the examples, what I said. So for example, uh, if you're thinking of a bird, a, uh, if you're thinking of a bird, uh, may mostly like a songbird or a lovebird comes to your mind for most people uh, or like common other birds. And, and in uh, that's what concepts and prototypes mean. Then there is decision, decision making where the neuroscientists have identified a lot of brain region, like the regions of the brain work together to for decision making. So your prefrontal cortex, your parietal cortex, and your basal ganglia again works for decision making. And your hippocampus with your peri parietal cortex and prefrontal cortex helps in problem solving. And creativity is a uh, they're still learning about creativity. So, uh, however, they still have like some theories about it, like temporal lobe, your temporal lobe has, a, uh, like involved, is involved in uh, creativity and your cortex is involved in creativity, uh, mostly your frontal cortex. So that's how they, uh, they have categorized it. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, so increased activity in your frontal lobe. So you, uh, as I said, when I was talking about the brain, your frontal lo lobe, uh, if there's increased activity in the frontal lobe, it is known to be associated with focus, attention, and problem solving uh, process. So that's how it works. Each, and it's not like only the frontal lobe is working for problem solving. There are other parts of the brain uh, like working together to uh, make this uh, like, you'll have this aha moment when you're uh, suddenly got a solution to a problem. So this is all related to your frontal, prefrontal cortex. And those are just one of the few topics uh, I could go on about other topics that affect the brain, like your sleep, how you're dreaming, uh, language, remembering and forgetting. Then there is intelligence. There is, uh, these all con um, come under psychology and neuroscience. So I could, I would need another hour or so to explain all of these, but we'll just move to our last topic of today, and it is brain health and wellness. Mm -hmm. So brain health and wellness is how to keep a healthy brain. It has this basic eating a healthy diet, getting regular exercise, getting sleep, but most uh, people do focus on that, but most people don't focus on how to manage stress. Like when you are given so many tasks, uh, like your brain has to, your brain cannot like get into panic mode and start stressing about things. Instead, just calm yourself down and think about it. Or another way to like improve your like brain is learning new things, which is, which helps it to keep it active. So learning a new hobby or learning a new language or reading books or playing instruments all of these can help in your brain, with your brain. So another thing uh, most people don't know, which is important for brain health is socializing. So don't always isolate yourself, always try to connect with friends and family. And don't always like sit at home and watch movies. I know a few people who does that. So like, sit at home and watch new like movies or just play games uh, straight gaming for four hours and all that stuff i think we reduce on that and start to socialize and interact with other people then you have 
limit your alcohol and caffeine. So I don't have to say about alcohol here, but mostly caffeine, which can harm the brain. So I would say don't completely stop it, but try to reduce it. So that's it. Now, if you guys have any questions, you can ask. So if you guys have any questions, raise your hand, then I'll call out, then you can ask. Yeah. Amna, do you have a question? No. Okay. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. Yeah, Aisha, you can ask. My question is, where is this ESF produced from? Yes, I couldn't hear you. Can you hear me? Your voice is a bit computery. Can you say it one more time? Okay, can you hear me now? Again, one more time. Okay, like my question is, yeah. where is the CSF produced from and how does it circulate? What, where is what produced? Cerebral. Cerebral. Fluid. fluid it's, it's not fluid in the brain yeah okay so it's not like produced it is a fluid in the brain it's but it's not produced it's reabsorbed and uh, it helps us to like it helps the brain like float in the brain so it doesn't crash with your skull and it nowhere. doesn't yeah, so what? it just comes out of nowhere it's not like made no no, no. it doesn't actually come out of nowhere um, I haven't uh, read about mostly about the fluid, but uh, it is, uh, what do you call it? I only know like the function and how it works. I don't know okay, where the okay. fluid comes from. Okay. Can I ask my question? Yeah, we can ask. Yeah, so it's very simple. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I doubt that. Yes. Uh, you know, there are many people tell about wet hair can cause your headache and like, you know, going on what? Wet hair, like keeping your hair wet can cause a headache and stuff. And I haven't heard many people say that, but they do say wet hair can cause illness, like as in you will get sick. Yeah, why? Mm. Mostly, it's not. It's not uh, actually related to. No, 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 I'm asking like you know it. It can't go inside the brain, right? Because it's no, like, no, no. yeah. So it's very protective. So, uh, it's not going in there. So it's not related to the topic. It's not going in there. It's not going in the brain actually. Okay. No, your the water just don't seep into the brain. No, that's not how it works. Okay. But yeah. It's not related to neuroscience. So the next topic is uh, yeah. like you told the brain have different parts for different stuff. Why can't it all be together in the same place? See, that is not... Uh, uh, you're saying why can't every part be together, right? Yeah. So if your computer uh, was like that, it's basically like a circuit system. So if your circuit... Uh, I'm just saying, if your circuit was like that, then with one switch, we can turn on all the lights. So it's something like that. And it's if you like don't have uh, different parallel connections with your brain, I think that will affect how we live. And I don't think we'll be considered humans then. We'll be just like some other animals. But just think of it like this. Your brain is uh, it's like a circuit in a building where if everything is connected together and if you press one light, then all the switches, all the things starts working. And if you think it like that way, it's not, um, how would I say, it's not, it does not work like that. So are you saying that it works like that so that the brain can function more effectively yeah. without more energy. Yeah, basically, 
it is uh, like it has uh, all these different connections through different nerve cells to but it's interconnected okay i'm not saying it's not all like left apart it's all interconnected and it's really complex to know which nerve is uh, working with which organ always but it's not uh, it won't be good if all of it were connected to one place i didn't uh, if that answered you can ask yeah, the next question I have, I have a question is it devashish yeah yeah okay go on so um i don't know if this is related or not but yeah. when you said that hm's brain yeah. was studied was uh, like they studied his brain right yeah so like uh, i seen in these sci-fi movies where um you know the human brain is kept inside of some form of fluid mm -hmm. so, is that the real or is that just a representation by it can be yeah see it can be preserved for a certain amount of time actually so, it can be preserved forever but yeah, so how is it done like are they using embryotic fluid or something no see i i don't know much about what fluid they are using but i know that that fluid can keep it from decomposing from a long time and helps us study and that fluid also like helps uh i'm not i don't know much about the fluid but uh what the fluid does actually is and it's, it's real, real. It, it is, is real. Real. yeah it is real uh oh. it can be uh for data studies you can take the brain there are a lot of people who donate their brain for neuro to neuroscience uh so they could study more about it because it's the organ that still has a lot of uh, question marks, I'd say. Wait, but uh, one thing, when you said they donated their brain, yeah. are you meaning like... After that. At the time, or their family donated the brain? So if the person uh, like wants to donate it for science, for that, then they like, they'll be... Like after that, death, you can take my brain to do whatever you want. Like so that. after death, yeah, so after death. Death. Okay. Can I ask a question? Yes, Amir. How does the brain work if it's going a signal? If it's signaling the parts of our body? So, Amir, that's a very complex thing. I will tell you one example which will help you. Uh, so, when you touch something hot, okay. you take your hand immediately, right? You don't put it there for a yeah. long time. Yeah. So why do you do that? Because the instant you touch it, a uh, electrical signal goes from your finger to your central uh, nervous system, which is your brain. Then your brain tells that part of the uh, body, not like retrieve your hand from whatever you're touching and your brain will retrieve it. And then we will still feel the pain, but it's all then another signal will go and like tell you that this place is hurt this place has a minor burn so all of this is together working happening together so it sends an electrical signal actually it's called an impulse so th the signal it's not like slow it's, it doesn't like take a like a minute a few seconds to go it's a one like point Zero 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 thirteen millisecond. I don't know. Thirteen millisecond process. It just shorts up and you retrieve your hand from the impulse. So that is one explain. I can explain it to you. Did you understand that part? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Thank one you. Question. Will the brain memory ever run out? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it won't. Like it won't like run out. It can. You can forget stuff, but you can't. Uh, like run out of space to keep information but even no uh, even if uh, like you uh, want to keep more information then you uh, if you like want to keep mo more information then some memories in the past like memories if you were 
three you it will start uh, let's say like degenerating so it so, is basically so, running out but it have an auto delete option yeah basically okay. deleting old memories useless memories to store new ones okay but it's not always like that some it a different it uh, depends on what type of like if you have a healthy brain and if your brain is really like some people have like memory throughout their life they remember everything but some people don't remember much like that there is one question one more question again uh, how like you told drinking causes neurological disorder how that yeah happens? so um i couldn't i can't say specifically like which disorder but how drinking affects your brain is so you know you lose your body balance after drinking yeah uh and when you drink the like alcohol in it goes into your blood and since your blood vessels are also connected to your brain and especially the back the where the cerebellum is there it hits that spot and you and the cerebellum is a place where bad it's where you you learn to walk so if that it hits that place and you will lose your balance so you will have movement disorders like that so okay. if it's oh, can i ask a question can i ask a question yeah yeah so like my question is that um what will happen uh, what will happen if our brain gets damaged is it there like, any chance that it could uh, you know uh, regenerate because, yeah we can uh, heal our brain like people uh, i'm i'm not sure how but we uh, they most of them what from what i i have read they said we can uh, like how do you say heal our brain but some of it is uh, like memory loss and all some of it sometimes it's permanent sometimes you just have to hit the right spot to get your memory back so like so, when you uh, damage your brain what are the worst symptoms you could get from it so if you see uh, if i like when i told about neurological disorder yeah. if it's a injury like if you heard the story i said uh, have you did you hear the story i said about hm yeah yeah so he had he injured his uh, brain and he mostly injured the central part of his brain which is called uh, the hippocampus so yeah. they had to remove it it because uh, it wouldn't heal itself and it's not uh, like healing itself and it's causing more trouble as in causing more seizures to him so they had and to remove it yeah. yeah i have another question thank you what and then my next question is that is it possible that you could uh, transfer brains in a way like mm -hmm. if you can re remove it from a particular body like remove and yeah and put it with another person actually, like would their memories <laughs> like actually uh, if you remove the brain basically your uh, are you talking about transplant yes so more like oh i like, uh, if this is possible like would it uh, make the other person with the other person's brain like get a, their memories that is still a question uh, yeah. which is in my mind and also like uh, they're trying to figure it out like if yeah. if transplant is possible it's, still it's not possible we cannot yeah. transplant a brain yet but if it's possible will that brain have this person's memory or the other yeah. person's memory that still remains because we haven't done it we haven't actually transplanted a brain so yeah uh, is it possible know. to damage a brain by uh, having a lot of stress like you pressure yeah. yourself too much and yeah. that will uh, damage mostly your uh, neurotransmitters which like dopamine and all and serotonin yeah. and all so if you are like uh, too much stressed your and stress equals like you you'll be mm. um, all those sad emotions will come and yeah, you'll be thank you. anxious and depressed yeah yes thank you i have a question yes uh, amir what's the difference about the uh, mm -hmm. test brain and the brain what's the i didn't hear what what's the difference about the scientist brain and our brain the scientists like uh, they train their brain to keep uh, like inform like store more information and for that uh, like 
it's not uh, because they are very smart they like some people have a good brain uh, as in uh, like a strong brain when they are uh, what do you say uh, born and some people not that much but they train their brain you can train your brain to remember more and nowadays uh, i i'll say uh, I have I have watched videos where you can train your brain to uh, like keep your memory in, like in place and not uh, like whatever you learn keep it in your brain itself and not lose it. So like normal brain and scientist brain, uh, mostly when you like learn new things and your neural connections get strengthened or you form new neurons. So. The difference, I could say, the main difference, I could say, they have more neurons than us because they are storing more and more information. And uh, scientists are like uh, studying a lot of things, which, like, how do I say, which generates more and more neurons, which develops more and more neurons and strengthen their neurons. So, yeah. yeah. Another question yeah. I have. Thank you. Yes, you know, is bipolar, you know, bipolar disorder. You know? I have heard about it, yeah. So what is it? Um, I have heard about it. I haven't researched more about the actual, like, very crucial mental disorders like bipolar and schizophrenia and all that stuff. But uh, from uh, what I have heard, actually, uh, bipolar is like, uh, it's a really uh, what do you say gruesome type mental disorder so I haven't I don't know much about it and how what it causes and all that stuff uh, but it's uh, it's where you like you have hallucinations I've heard it from uh, one of my like uh, aunts because she did learn psychology and she was explaining to me uh, what happened in like her and patients in the asylum so i have heard her say, i don't remember much what she told but it's uh, this guy had uh, bipolar and this guy was uh, hallucinating a lot and he had to be uh, drugged a lot to keep him safe because he's always going insane and all that stuff yeah so, one more question is like yeah. how is like neural link connecting to our brain and how does it work how does I didn't understand your question? So you know, Neuralink made by Elon Musk. How is it connecting to the brain? Ah, you're talking about Elon Musk trying to put chips in our brain to control yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I have. Uh, I don't know much about that, but uh, I think I heard they tested it on lab, like in the lab with animals, and they're now moving on to. Uh, what is called real people, but uh, wasn't it like controlling, uh, being able to control your device with your brain? Is yeah. it something like that? I don't know much about it, but that uh, whatever I said just now, that's the only thing I have heard about Neuralink. So I don't know how it affects the brain. I don't, and I don't know if I. Uh, okay, Jenna. So I can see many other hands raised. Ravabi, do you have a question? Kendra. Yeah. Oh but... yeah, Kendra. You guys. Yeah, can and ask. Ravabi is also there. Ravabi, yeah. did you raise your hand to ask a question? She never got a chance. Ravabi. Yeah, ma'am. Please ask your question. Okay. How the headache is uh, coming through the brain or something else? So uh, mostly headaches are caused by like when you stress on like a lot of stuff like uh, you have too much uh, uh, like load of work where you won't be able to uh, you'll be uh, confused you'll be like stressed so that will cause headaches but I don't know much about migraines and headaches uh, I did some uh, like uh, research on how headaches occur but mainly when you focus one part of your brain to do one task for a specific period of time then that will cause a headache. Okay, thank you. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, Amir, you have asked, uh, Kendra haven't asked 
question. So okay. let's give her a chance. Kendra, you can go now. Um, I can't hear you. Yeah, I can't hear Kendra. Okay, what about Amna? Fatima, Amna has yeah, Amna, you can. So, uh, you before told that you yeah. can train your brain, right? Yeah. How can we like train our brain? So, uh, what uh, from what I have seen, if you want to remember a lot more things, like right now, and we are, uh, I'm studying, so I have a lot of information to remember. We can uh, use a lot of methods like active recall or the three R's. Uh, like review, recall, uh, like review, read, review, and then recall, like that. All those, there are a lot of methods where we can uh, train our brain to improve our memory. So there is this thing called second brain. I don't know much about second brain. Then there is a blurting method. It, it all helps us like learn more things. It's for people who have a lot of uh things to store in their brain and yeah you can you can actually do that okay can okay, ask Jana. question yeah Jenna so just wait a minute I have a small dot what about yeah. checking on your diet whether you're having a proper diet there are yeah, certain foods, that too, right that too. yeah that too is an important yeah aspect right yeah you, you need like you, you don't uh, most people I have seen is they cut on sugar to reduce their like fat and all but the thing you need for your brain is fat and protein so i don't get why people uh, cut on their glucose cut on their sugar so that's one thing what she yeah so said. there are certain food that is rich i mean that's uh that helps in sharpening yeah. your brain brain yeah all that yeah the memory boosts but up your memory but people cut it that. off because their body isn't reacting to it as well as their brain yeah. Okay, dear. So who knew? You can carry on. Yes. So we have 10 more minutes, okay? We can give you extra 10 minutes because I yeah. can see many hands raised here. Yeah. So those who haven't asked the question can ask now. Nuha? Yeah. Nuha's hand is raised. Abigail can go. I already asked. All right. Yeah, Abigail. then Abigail, you can ask. Why did you choose this topic? Uh, yeah, I was expecting. So why I chose this topic was our rest of our organs or organ system have a specific job, but your brain is actually connected to all your organs and it it is what actually uh, facilitates your whole body. So even if there wasn't a heart, you cannot live, but the one controlling that heart is your brain. So I thought taking a uh, doing an open exploration about this topic was better for for me and everybody else. Yeah. Yes, Jenna. So it was a very informative session, dear, and you answered Thank all you, the questions. Thank you managed you, to answer all the questions very confidently as well. Yeah. So it's almost time, children. Jenna, so I have a question. I have a question. Oh, okay. I have a question. Okay, so Jenna, I have heard about the open surgery of brain without giving anesthesia. Will you please explain more about it? Open, can you repeat that? Open brain surgery without giving anesthesia. The I surgeries are done. In yeah, I haven't researched much on uh, like surgeries or uh, like how surgeries work, but um, so yeah, I'm unable to answer that question. Uh, sorry, ma'am. Okay, and what about how dreams are connected with the brain? Yeah, so yeah, I did do a bit of research like about dreams. So scientists are still having a, a lot of question marks on why we dream. But the reason is when we are like having REM sleep, it's a, uh, a type of sleep where your Thalamus is actually active. So it sends images and sounds and sensation to the cerebral cortex. So this is why we can feel and hear and see in our dream. And during the uh, sleep, 
and your prefrontal cortex is less active. So you don't need planning and logic and all that when you're sleeping. So I don't know why we dream, but when we dream, the reason we can see and hear in our dreams is due to the thalamus and your cerebral cortex. So I hope I have answered like a few questions. Okay, thank you. Quick thank question. You. Thank you. Good one. Yes. Good one. Yeah, good one, Janna. So, Amir, just give me a minute, my dear. Uh, we have an evaluation form to fill. Okay. So, the acmes middle and brain X middle can leave. So, Amir, you can quickly ask your question. Brain X, uh, brain X higher and Cosmos middle, please be here. Okay. Don't leave. No. Amir, please ask. Yeah. Ma'am, yeah, ma can I read the weight of a brain? Ma'am, I will leave, ma'am. It's about three yes, pounds. Yes. If, uh, if it's an adult human brain, it's about three pounds. So, kids. Okay. So, the Atmos middle, can brain X middle. Thank you so much for joining. You can leave, okay? Brain X higher and Cosmos middle, please stay back. I'll share.